This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you via the Secret Library Podcast Patreon. To become a supporter, you can visit patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 124 of the Secret Library Podcast. My guest this week is Rachel Fuganiti, who is an Audi-nominated audiobook narrator and voice actor who lives in Los Angeles. A veteran of the stage, she's a graduate of the two-year Meisner Conservatory at the School for Film and Television in Manhattan and holds a degree in theater from the University of New Hampshire. She got her start on New York City stages, doing theater and sketch comedy before moving to LA and transitioning to life behind the mic. Over the past seven years, Rachel has brought more than 100 audiobooks to life for publishers such as Harper, Blackstone, Penguin Random House, and Brilliance, among others. She's voiced for hundreds of brands across radio, television, and new media, and can currently be heard on the Tennis Channel. Also a writer, her essay, So Many Reasons Why, will be included in the upcoming anthology, Nevertheless, We Persisted, Me Too. She's working on her first book, a memoir about fertility, motherhood, and her foster-to-adopt journey. So I was so excited to have Rachel on the show because this addresses a topic that has really been on my mind for ages. Of course, how do you make an audiobook out of your book? Um, as listeners of a podcast, I know you're all into audio. And as people who want to write books, I know that you're thinking audio plus writing, audio plus writing. So believe me, I have been on the hunt for ages for the right audiobook narrator to talk to on the show. And Rachel is amazing. She's a wonderful writer and appreciates the writer side of the story. And she's an incredible audiobook narrator. So I knew she was the right fit. So we had an amazing conversation about really practical steps. You can take what it takes, where to go, who to talk to, how to assess, how to audition. If you want to make an audiobook version of your book, or if you're working with a publisher who's doing it, this is how the process works and how to get it done. So I could not be more excited to share this episode because I know you're going to have a to-do list and a sense of what it takes to make your book into audio after listening. So here we go with Rachel Fulganini. Hey, Rachel. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. So I have long wanted to dive into this topic, which is the audiobook process, because It seems like a natural, given that we are in an audio show right now and everyone listening wants to write books. So it seems inevitable that the concept of audiobooks is of interest to everyone. And what we wanted to do, because you and I spoke a little bit before about the fact that there are different processes that may happen if you want to produce an audiobook. And the three cases... I can think of, feel free to add more if you see them, are if you are publishing traditionally and working with a publisher in order to do the audiobook, or you are publishing traditionally, but you've retained the audio rights and are publishing the audio independently, or if you're 100% indie doing both the book publishing and the audio publishing yourself, um, working with a narrator. So I think we'll dive into all of those. What are your thoughts sort of just initially about the broad strokes differences between working with a publisher to produce the audio versus working with a narrator directly? Sure. Great question. So when you're working with a publisher, you're really entrusting the publisher um, in terms of the outcome of the book. So you oftentimes don't get a say in who's going to be reading your book. Um, Sometimes it seems like over the last couple of years, they're giving authors more of a choice and there's an auditioning process sometimes, but not always. So they have casting directors who know all of the narrators and um, will just send a book that they feel is a good fit for that narrator. And they're actually really, really good at their jobs usually. So um, they do a good job. Or they might select, you know, three to five narrators and then send out an audition, and then you do get some kind of a say. But there's there's kind of less control. You can, um, as an author, you can say what you're hoping for. If you have someone in particular in mind, you can suggest that person, but there's no guarantee that you're going to get that person, and um, you don't have as much direct contact. So that's the biggest difference, I think. 
Got it. And then, so what does it look like? Let's say you're in one of the other two cases where you're either retaining the audio rights or you have all of the process under your control as an independent author. How would people even who are kind of brand new at this, listening to this, saying, I would love to do this. I don't even know where to start. So where do they go to start connecting with potential narrators sure. for an audiobook? Sure. So the the biggest place is um, a platform called acx.com, audiobookcreationexchange.com. Uh, and it is run by um, Amazon. So that's something to know. And uh, you can connect with narrators there and um, select someone. Essentially, you can put out an audition and you can select someone through that process to produce your book. Uh, The other way would be to work with a smaller company that's a producing company that produces audiobooks. There's a lot of them uh, popping up all the time that are, are doing that for you, like they'll do that work for you. So um, it depends. It depends on how uh, how deeply involved you want to be. It depends on, you know, what your budget is and that sort of thing. Got it. So once they get onto ACX or work with the production company, what do you find is a good judge of how if someone's going to be a good fit for your book. I mean, I think this is sort of an aesthetic. I think of writers, we're all sort of hiding in our rooms, you know, typing away or writing away. And and maybe we envision the way an author would sound in our heads, but maybe we don't. So I'm sure. wondering how people start to connect with you and what's kind of, uh, what kinds of questions they ask. Absolutely. So uh, one good way is if you're familiar if you're familiar with their work with the narrator's work, you can point to specific books that you really enjoyed. That's a great way to do it. And I do recommend being specific about which books um, because different books require different things. And so if you just say, oh, I love I love her narration, but you're not specific, you might not get back. You might be thinking about this light romantic comedy that this narrator did. And then but your book isn't exactly like that. So it doesn't come off the same. So it's good to be as specific as you can. Like, I really enjoyed your narration on this book. Um, So that's one thing. And if it's the same genre, that kind of helps. Uh, I think that's that's a good way to to go. The other thing is asking for an audition. And when you ask for an audition, you're, you're going to want to do two things. You're going to want to get the narration itself, um, just the the narrator's voice. But you're also going to want to ask for some characters as well, like the pivotal characters, the main characters, a little bit of dialogue. Um, it's good to do a man and a woman. So you can see how that narrator handles both sexes. Um, And if there's anything that's, you know, really important to you in the book, then uh, you could ask for a chunk of that scene. But you have to know that the narrator hasn't read the whole thing yet. So they're not going to bring to it what they would after they've prepped the book and, um, and do it for real. But you can at least get a sense of where they are with that material. It's so interesting, because I think of you know, you think of narration, you think of the quality of voice. And there are, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. So there are definitely narrators that I'm attached to. And the ability with characters is so amazing these days. And I'm wondering, how do you go about coming up with just from your own perspective of coming up with the voices for each of the characters? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, And I did want to mention also if there's accents in the book, that's something that you should indicate and probably get a sample of that. Not every little character, you know, say there's a character that comes in for two lines and has a French accent. Eh, that's fine. But if it's a it's a main chunk of the book in an accent, you probably want to ask for a sample of that, too. Just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but in terms of what what was the specific question? I'm sorry, I lost. I wanted to That's throw okay. that in there and I lost the thought. No, no, no. I was interested in what your process is in coming up with voices for characters. Right. Gotcha. So the way that I do it is um, a narrator will always prep the book. Uh, and that means reading it through. And what I do is I I read it through once just to understand the story, and I sort of um, make notes about the characters as I'm going along. And then what I try to do is um, 
I try to put in my head someone that the character reminds me of. And that's the easiest way for me to connect to it. So whether that's somebody I know personally, like, oh, this character reminds me of my Aunt Joan. So I'm going to kind of do, it's not that I'm going to do an impersonation of my Aunt Joan, but I'm going to kind of like grab Aunt Joan's essence and Mm -hmm. do it that way. Sometimes I do stars, like, oh, this guy is like, you know, George Clooney. You know, and again, I'm not doing an imitation of George Clooney, but I'm kind of grabbing George Clooney's essence and kind of just bringing that to it. So that can be a great way to communicate with a narrator as well is if you have as a as an author, somebody in your head like, oh, you know, in the movie version of this, this would be Reese Witherspoon and, you know, Josh Hartnett or something. I don't know who it would be. Um you can tell them that. And that's a kind of a good thing for, for the narrator to be able to grab onto. Like, okay, yeah, I can kind of, I can feel that. Uh, that's that's the way that I do it. That's so interesting. Because yeah. it's, it's an unusual, I mean, it's a very unusual job in that you're taking a book and digesting it and sort of bringing it to life in a completely different way and bringing these people alive inside of that. Yes. And and here's the other thing. I think as an author, you also have to be open to interpretation because mm. once it's out of your hands, like you can, it's great to have good communication up front before anything is started. Like let the narrator know if you're working directly with the narrator, like let them know what's important to you. Um, you know, who these characters are to you, anything big that you really want them to know. But once you sign off on giving this job to the narrator, especially if they're producing it themselves, you're really signing off on the interpretation as well. So with ACX, they they let you approve the first 15 minutes. So you can listen to the first 15. They do the first 15 minutes. They upload it. You listen to it. And that's the time to say, like, oh, wait, I was thinking it would be a little different or something, and you can make tweaks. Now, if the first 15 minutes doesn't have any of those characters in it and doesn't have where you want, what you want to hear, then you should maybe select another 15 minutes for the the narrator to do. Um, But the point is, once you sign off on that, you're really signing off on them producing it. So it becomes like the narrator is the director and the producer. And uh, I think being open to interpretation, to allowing it to be, to maybe change and morph a little bit from where you thought it was, because you're you're working with somebody else now. So, and and it's not, and it's also important to understand, it's not a collaboration at that point because there just isn't, there isn't the budget or the time to get into the minutia of like. Oh, you know, in this chapter, this line should have been this way or whatever. You you really have to look at the whole thing as a whole and sort of let go a little bit and allow it to stand as a as a whole. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think it's the same if if people have books that are then made into movies. You know, you don't mm-hmm. get to direct the movie because exactly. you wrote the book. Yep. I mean, you may get input, you may weigh in on it, but this is more similar to that than to, you know, hanging out in the booth with you and exactly <laughs> saying, let's have another take, shall we? I mean, that sounds exactly. stressful yeah. for everybody. Yep. yep. So yep. what can someone do to be sort of the dream author to a narrator? Yeah. Um, communication up front is really, really good. Uh, so knowing, like having a clear vision, um, about who these people are, what this book is, uh, tone-wise, um, and uh, giving a heads up about any of the the things that they need to be thinking about um, is really good. Like, uh, you know, this character, uh, you don't find out until page 215, but this character is from Australia. <laughs> It's just good. Right. Not that the uh, not that the narrator wouldn't read. I mean, they should be reading the whole book, but it's just kind of a nice little heads up. You can give like you know what's a great thing is I've had some authors give a little blurb about each character, like main character, 
fantastic. Mm. Really helps to just have that reference list. Uh, maybe a synopsis of the book and a little character blurb for each one. Again, it's not absolutely necessary, and you don't want it to be like pages because that's like too much information. But just a little blurb, a little paragraph on each main character is, can be really helpful. Uh, and then who you kind of see them as if you were casting the movie. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, and then, honestly, it's about letting go and trusting, trusting that the narrator wants to do a really good job on your book. They really do. All and I, Any narrator who does this does it because they love it and they really want to do the best job they can. And if they're a professional, which you sh- hopefully vetted them and found out if they were professional beforehand, trust them. Trust them to to elevate the work and take it someplace a little new. Yeah, I think it, that's in some ways sounds like the most exciting option, especially in the case of fiction, that you get to meet your characters again through the audio version. Absolutely. And sometimes, like, I think things come out that maybe you didn't even realize were there as much. Uh, you know, where as an as a as an author, you're kind of like, wow. I, it's funny. I worked with a particular author on a book, and um, one of the characters was pretty dark. And I don't think that she, I guess she was aware of it, but I think in hearing it out, it was like, yeah, this is, I mean, this was at least my interpretation of it when when I read it and the way that it's written. And, um, and it's interesting. Here's another thing is um, vernacular or any kind of like the way a character speaks is important and it says a lot about the character. Um, and... Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that goes into just writing a good book, that it's all consistent, that if you're using any kind of like accent and you're writing in the accent, that it's sort of a consistent accent is good. Otherwise, the narrator might make it a consistent accent, because otherwise, (laughs) when the when the person's listening to the book, they're not going to know it wasn't written that way. So you kind of, you you know as a as a narrator you have to make sure that you're doing something that's going to hold up audio wise that's true yeah things you don't think about when you're writing i mean i think one of the <laughs> obvious points is things like dialogue where it's really important i think as you're writing to read your dialogue out loud so that yeah. you know that it sounds natural yep and then later on, if you give it to a narrator, that it'll be easier for them to perform. Right, right. And there's also a thing about, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's a thing about authors wanting to read their own work. And just a word about that is that, honestly, like, I would say probably eight times out of 10, it's it's going to be better to trust somebody who does it for a living, to trust a professional um, if it's your dream to read your own thing, well, then you got to go for it. That's your dream and you have to make it happen. Um, but it's a lot trickier than than you would think. And I think sometimes authors get into trouble where it's a really awesome book and they maybe just they don't have that skill, but they really wanted to do it themselves and they miss the opportunity for it for the audio to really be out of this world because they wanted to do it themselves. So that's a, I know it's kind of a sensitive topic because a lot of people do want to read their own book and they have every right to do that. But it's something to really think about, I think. I think so. I mean, it's interesting too, because I see a lot of times it happening in nonfiction as well, that Mm -hmm. people will read their own book and then sometimes it really works and sometimes it does not. And And then there are other people like, I don't think anyone but Neil Gaiman should read his own work because his voice is so incredible. Yep. But, but not everybody's Neil Gaiman. Right. Right. And I do think, yeah, you miss out. And it's interesting too, because I've heard of people who don't want to read their own, like they've done one book themselves and then they don't want to do it anymore. And those are all the people, always the people that are good at it. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I know people are like, oh, but it was so good. Why didn't you do it again? They're like, oh, I hated doing it because it's hard. It's really hard. It's very, very labor intensive. It's very time consuming. It's a lot of hours in the booth. Yes. So let's talk about that. So People get to, you know, if they're working through ACX, they get to approve the first 10 minutes. And then depending on how long your book is, you know, there's all of this time. I mean, everybody knows you can read a book 
on the page, at least I can much faster than I can listen to the audio because it takes longer to read something out loud. So about how long does it take to record a novel that's say two to 300 pages? Yeah, it's it's um, always good to go by word count and not pages because pages could be different depending on how big, you know, how it's formatted or whatever. So um, a good rule of thumb is that an hour, about an hour of audio is 9,300 words. So you can do it that way. Um, just to figure out how long is this, you know, if your book is 98,000 words, divide that by 9,300, and you're going to find out how many hours it is approximately. Um, So that's one thing. And then in terms of the recording of it, for a a pro narrator who's been doing it a long time, assuming that there's no crazy accents or anything really difficult, it's usually about a one to two ratio. So it would be two hours in the booth for every one hour of recorded audio but that's a that's a really good ratio Got so it. um depending on the book the difficulty of the book again any accents or anything like that it could be a 3 to 1 ratio um it also depends if the narrator is going to be having somebody recording them or if they're going to be recording themselves it's much slower when you're recording yourself as a narrator because you have to switch right and left brain all the time uh, than if you are going into a studio and have an engineer working for you. That's when it's a two-to-one ratio. If if you don't have that, it's almost impossible to have a two-to-one ratio. And how would you know if your narrator is going to be recording in a studio or if they're working in a booth? Sure. You can, um, if you're working directly with them, chances are they're working, they're recording themselves. Got it. Um, some narrators hire engineers to come to their house, and then that would come out of their pocket. To I do that a lot if I'm um, if I'm really busy and I just don't want to spend the time. Then I'll hire somebody out of my cut to come in and engineer me. But usually that would be a home studio situation. If you're going through a publisher, it could be either, and you may not know. It's not really it's not something that you would know, I guess, unless you asked. And I'm not sure that it matters necessarily as long as the the finished product is professional, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, of course. I think it's just in terms of if you're turning it over, you've signed off, then about how long is it between uh, that point gotcha. and when you get the files or yeah, the finished audio? Again, that depends on the situation. It depends on how the narrator works, like some narrators will spread the work out and just do a couple hours every day and and do the book over two weeks, two or three weeks. Most narrators, myself included, will do the book in like three days because we just don't have the time. So you record like six or seven hours a day for three days and it's in the can. So and if you're certainly if you're working in a studio, um, an outside studio, that's how it is because they have to just schedule it and, you know, we have these three days, and this is the time that we have it. Uh, then there's, a, of course, a process. Like if you're working with um, a publisher, then you we send them the audio. Then they will proof it, and then they'll kick back uh, what we call pickups, like any mistakes that there were. So then that's a, a, a process. Um, then I would give them the corrections. Then they would have their editor go in and um, – put it all together, like plug in the corrections. And then there may be a QC person. Every publisher is different. So there might be a QC that then gives it another listen, or there might not. It depends on the publisher. And so I would say the the entire process is probably um, at least four weeks. I would say four to six weeks, probably. Wow. Yeah. And then if the narrator is doing it themselves, if they're producing it themselves, they have to do all that themselves. So in that case... um, it's usually about a month at at the at the shortest, I would say, unless you're really in like a crazy hurry and I want to get this out before Christmas. Well, the narrator can agree to that if that's something that they can do. Right. So that's the time. And then there is, of course, the money portion of the whole thing. So yeah. what is the general kind of agreement process. I've I've heard very little about how this works if you want 
to work with a narrator directly. I mean, obviously sure. if you have a publisher, they handle it and they're producing it and right. it's on them and you don't have to think about it at all. But if you're working with a narrator, what are the kinds of models that people can expect to encounter? Sure. So um, uh, audiobooks are paid on a per finished hour basis. So you're not paying for the studio time. You're paying for that finished book. So if your book is 10 finished hours, you're paying a certain amount per, you know, for each finished hour. So that's why it it is it behooves the narrator to be quick, right? To be like a good solid narrator that can get a two to one ratio. Otherwise, the amount of time it takes, you, you start making less and less money. That's why when you when you start out as a narrator, it's really abysmal because you're taking, you know, it's like a four to one ratio or something crazy. Um, the the amount that you get paid is um, typically anywhere from two hundred to four hundred per finished hour, and it depends on a bunch of stuff. Um, if you're paying for only audio and you have somebody else doing the post, then it might be like two hundred uh, to twenty, something like that. Uh, if you're paying for the whole thing, which a lot, you know, most indie authors would be doing, it's more like, again, it depends on the narrator, 325 per finished hour, 350, maybe 400, because they're doing everything. So they might be hiring somebody to do the post if they don't do it themselves, um, that kind of thing. So, but it depends. You can also, on ACX, they have something called royalty share. And in that case, you're not paying anything. You're sharing a portion of your profits. And um, I don't do that. I, I Most, like, really experienced narrators don't really do that because it's just not – you don't get that return on your investment necessarily. Um, although I know some people who have. Um but, uh, yeah, so that's an option as well. But you ha just have to be careful in terms of that, like, how experienced is this person if they're willing to work for royalty share. Right. But you could still do an audition and you could still do everything that you would do normally. Right. It's just that that model is generally more appealing to newer narrators. Yeah, typically, I think that's how most narrators are getting their start these days. And... um when I started, they didn't even have ACX, so we weren't we were working directly for publishers. Um, and you know, I know some people have done really quite well uh, with that, but um, it, it's yeah, it's not something that I typically do. There is something also called a stipend, which ACX used to do. I'm not sure how much they're doing it anymore. Where they'll give um, it'll be like a hundred dollar stipend to the narrator. And then it's royalty share. I'm not even sure if they're doing that anymore. Um, so that can be incentive. Um, and, you know, it depends if you want to share that, if you want to share the back end, if you want to share that that money with them, um, it may not be a lot. I mean, it might, but it might not. So, um, and then it's that speaks to the whole question of whether you even really want to go through Amazon, like Audible or not. I know a lot right. of authors feel um, dicey about that because they have to give away so much of it. Uh, obviously, the upside of it is the distribution. There's just it's just so widely um, available. So that's a decision that authors have to make as well. So what are they giving up by going through Amazon? And what are some of the other options they could consider? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question that unfortunately I don't know that much about. That's I know okay. that That's there okay. are a whatever you know is a good start. It's yeah. more than we know. Yeah, so there you're giving up, you're certainly giving up a good portion to Amazon for the you know, for the privilege of being on Audible and all that stuff. Um and then there are a few other alternative companies now that are alternatives to Audible, um, and I, I wish that I knew what those were. You could maybe I know Google one that's audiobooks.com. Okay, yep. I've heard of that. Yep, sure. So um, I think it's something to do research on and just figure out what what the, the best fit is. Um, I mean, to me, it seems like you kind of want to be on Audible because that's just what – it's just so huge. Right. 
Especially but, if you're a new author, it seems like that's a good way to be discovered. It's sort of, it's similar to the question of, you know, independent authors wondering, well, should I go with Kindle distribution or should I be on other platforms, you know, and go wider? It's, right. uh, should I be exclusive? All of these same kinds of questions that you face, you know, right. no matter what digital format you're going with. Right. And I also did want to mention about the rate thing that um, audiobooks are um, union. I mean, they're not all union, but uh, again, most professional narrators are going to want a union contract and you can get that through ACX. They made it really easy to have it to have that done. So that that's something you can do. If you are not going through ACX, you can still add like the narrator may ask you for a union contract and they can do one off contracts with the union. And the rates are really reasonable. Um, it's something that over the last, I would say, seven, eight years or so, they've been organizing. And it's been amazing for narrators to have that income be union income. And so that that's important to a lot of narrators. So just to put it out there. No, that's great. I think it's important that everybody wins from the work. Yeah, are you seeing sort of over time, what are you seeing in terms of the trend as to the types of books looking for audio narration or sort of how much audio there tends to be? I mean, I've been watching it for a long time because I, I was, you know, back in my early days listening to stuff on actual physical tapes, mm -hmm. even before there mm -hmm. were CDs, I was yep. doing that. So it's been really interesting to watch it kind of explode, but I'm wondering what your take is on the industry as a whole and what you're seeing as a narrator. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like almost everything now is is being turned into audio. It's just, it's, I, I think there was something like, I don't know what it was last year, but I remember the figure being something like there was 33% more audiobooks last year than the year before. And that was wow. the case the year before as well. 33% is a lot. That's just That's kind huge. of mind blowing. So it's almost kind of like, I feel like it's kind of expected now, like people want audio because it's such a, in today's fast paced world, it's it's a way to multitask, right? So I can be driving and I can be reading a book or I can be doing housework and reading a book or, you know, whatever. And I think people just want that now. So I just feel like more and more everything is being turned into audio. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was a trick I played on myself when I was still in LA and had a job for a few years that required me to drive all the way from one side of LA to the other twice a day, which mm -hmm. took forever. It was one of those 16 miles, yet it takes at least an hour <laughs> oh, kind yeah. of commutes. Oh, yeah. And I tried for several years to convince myself, oh, I'm not commuting. I'm just getting a ton of reading done because <laughs> I listened to so many audiobooks. But after three years, I was like, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I can't be in the car this much. But yep. I do periodically have a certain amount of nostalgia for how much audio I was listening to during that time. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I think LA, I, I wonder if they did a study, LA would probably be like the, the maximum uh, user uh, situation because we're all in our cars so much. Oh, totally. Yeah. Although, you know, I think in New York, you probably listen to it on the subway too. Well, that's it's true. sort of, yeah. I think anywhere where you have to transport yourself from one place to another and then want to kind of tune out the process as you go. I right. think that is an excellent location for audio. Yep. 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 Are you seeing any shift in the genres that you're you're working with or is it pretty consistent? It's interesting. I, I've been doing a lot of nonfiction lately, um, which is it's actually really interesting and informative and um so so there's that. And and even things that you wouldn't necessarily think would be on audio. For instance, I did this book about your gut microbiome. And she goes into a whole thing about, you know, she has um, a 30-day detox within this book. And so I was, like, reading it out, like, the instructions to it. And she has recipes. And I was reading out the recipes. And it was kind of funny to me because I was like, are people really going to listen to this and how are they going to like, are they going to keep pressing pause and like writing it down? Or like, I was just kind right. of like, wow, this is really interesting, but they want this and people must want it if they're, if the publisher is asking for this. So um, I think things are coming out on multiple formats now too. So people will get the audio, but they'll also get 
the ebook or something. And so they have multiple formats of the same book. Um, well, they also have deals now where you can get kind of the ebook and then there's a discount if you get the narration as there well. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I also find it really interesting when there are things like recipes or even visual references like I'm a big fan of books that have a map in the beginning. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I don't even know how you would begin to narrate a map. It's like, okay, in the center, there's this country. Yeah. And then over to the right, kind of slightly yeah. to the northeast, there's this. I mean, you just can't do it. Yeah. Um, Sometimes so they'll I, say, go to this website if you want more visuals or something. Or they'll, they, they might just cut out that stuff. Sometimes it's just like, I'll get a manuscript and they'll say, you know, we're not reading this. Don't read these things. Mm. So it it depends. Yeah. I mean, that might be a fun thing to do if you have a nonfiction book or even if you have a fiction book and there's a lot of visuals to give people an incentive to say, sign up for your mailing list or stay in touch with you. You know, you can connect and get these you can get these visual references elsewhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, something that um, authors do that's really a good idea sometimes is they'll put this is when I'm working directly with an author they'll put their URL or something at the end like if you like this book you know check out more at blah 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 it's a great like you should definitely do that you know because it's just a good little uh, plug for yourself I know you mentioned once when we've talked about this on a separate occasion that maybe you narrated a series is that right yeah absolutely I've done a lot of series actually yeah because that's great. great that you build a relationship. You have a consistent narrator that you're used to as the listener. And also, it seems like a great marketing opportunity at the end to be able to say, and you can listen to more adventures with this person at, or these characters. It's brilliant. I think from an author point of view, it's just the smartest thing. People, the fans love series. They love it because they get to feel like they're a part of a whole world. It happens a lot in romance. So that's where Mm. I've seen it the most is um, in romance. And people really get into the the family. Like oftentimes it'll center on a family. And then each book will be like a different sibling's love story or something like that. Or, you know, sometimes they'll do like there's a love story and then the best friend of the the primary uh, person in this book, the next book focuses on her. So they kind of like give you this breadcrumb at the end, like the best friend meets somebody or, you know, or they put the tension in there with the the girl's best friend and the guy's best friend. And then in the next book, they get together or something like that. So there's a lot of opportunities to do fun stuff. Even I've done stuff where it's like, oh, now it's the shop owner. So the shop owner appeared oh God, only like, so cute. yeah, like only appeared like once or twice, but she was cute and she had a good personality. And so now there's this book is about the shop owner who meets this other guy. So it's, it, it can be kind of a fun, it's fun. And I think as an author, it's a brilliant marketing strategy for sure. Yeah. And, I, I wonder, has the course of a, a story or a series ever changed because of a choice you made as a narrator? Yeah, it's funny. It can be a little bit tricky if they don't. Again, it's like putting in those clues as the writer so that we know that this person had the Australian accent or something. Because what happens if you voiced it, you voiced the character and it was just a peripheral character and you did an American accent and then you find out in book three, oh, he's from the UK or something. Like it's it's a little bit like as a writer, it's a great idea if you're thinking about doing audio to like think about that stuff and just sort of like place those little clues so that your narrator can pick up on that and remember like, okay, this person had an accent and so on and so forth. So, um, and, and then the other be bigger later. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is changing narrators can be really, I mean, fans get really mad. They, because they get used to the voice, as you said, they get used to that narrator. So it can be dicey to change narrators mid series, um, the exception to that would be if the book is really focused on a different character, sometimes you can, what they're doing sometimes now is they're having ev- like having every book voiced by a different narrator, which mm. is interesting. And then a good narrator will get in touch with the other narrators who did the other books and be like, hey, do you have voice samples for these characters so that I can sort of approximate where you were with these guys? 
Right. So that's a, a thing of, you know, the narrator taking it upon themselves to to get in touch with the other narrators and, and find that out. And if if you know that kind of stuff as an author, it's great to tell the narrator because sometimes the narrator isn't even aware that this was a series. Like they could be like, oh, I didn't even know. I just got this book and I had no idea there were three books before this. Right, because they might have different names and they might not be named like right. in the such and such series. That isn't always on the cover right, or in the exactly. manuscript. Oh, yeah, that would be very helpful. Tell your narrator if your book is part of a series. Absolutely. These are all excellent tips. Yep. Because I could see also, like, given if there's a collaboration, like you get your book back and the narrator has voiced a character that you thought wasn't such a big deal, but you love the the you know, the way that they've been characterized so much that you want to write more about them in the next book. I Absolutely. just wonder yeah, if and you I can think kind that of fall happen. in love with somebody. I think that happens sometimes. I, I have one narr- one author that I've been working with for a really long time since I started. And I always kind of think that she, I almost feel like, and maybe I'm just thinking this, but I'm like, I feel like she wrote this for me. Like a little bit, like I, like she kind of knows where I would go and she kind of plays into that a little bit, which is really interesting and and cool because it becomes every book that I do of hers is easier and more fun than the last because it's like, it's just a really good fit. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, I think after a certain point, if you've done a whole bunch of her books for a long time, she can't help but hear your voice in her head as she's writing, writing everything. Yep. I think that's true. It reminds me of that movie, Stranger Than Fiction, where Emma Thompson is the writer of those books and um, Will Ferrell starts hearing her narrating in his yeah. head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I think, you know, you got to hope that you've got a narrator you like listening to if they're going to be narrating in your head. I exactly. think Emma Thompson's then- a pretty good choice. Every once in a while, that narrator might not be available, and that's a bummer. Oh, that's a heartbreaker. Yeah, because that's like, oh, man. So then y- you may not even have control. Like, the publisher might be like, look, this has to come out. Like, this is, we have to go with somebody else. So that that can be a tough situation. That is. That's really tough. I mean, I think that's something, if you have a favorite narrator and then you ask for them, it may be that lots of people like them and then it's harder. Exactly. So it may be a benefit to go with somebody a little bit more unknown in order to have more f- control over their availability, maybe. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Obviously, you want to get, if you can get somebody who already has an amazing following and an amazing name, that's great for you. Because some people choose based on the narrator, like, oh, I'm just going to listen to everything that Hillary Huber does because I love her, you know, or whatever. So right. that it can be. But yeah, the downside of that is they might not be as available. Right. Yeah. I mean, for people who primarily consume books through listening, then obviously the narrator is huge for them. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got my little favorites. Everybody, yeah. I think, who listens to audio has ones that they they feel like, oh, this is my friend who tells me stories. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's crazy. So if you had one thought for somebody who's thinking, should I put my book into audio? Should I not? Should I risk it? What would your What would your advice be to them? I think nowadays you absolutely should. I just think it's... It's such a growing, growing field and people want it. And the last thing you want is for it to not be available, for, for there to be a demand and you to just be like, yeah, no, don't have it. I just think it's something that, you know, you want to do it right. So I would say have a budget, like don't try to go cheap on it. Like don't try to just get it done to get it done. Have a budget, have a couple thousand dollars, which might take you a while to get there, but have some money to spend on it so that you can put out a really good product. And unfortunately, I think it's a little bit of a building thing. Like you might not see an awesome return on your first book, but if you keep doing it, I think you you will. So, I mean, I think it depends on how much you care about it, but I also just feel the world is super into audio these days. I think it's important. I think so, too. I think that's great advice, especially if you're writing a series. Find your author, find your narrator now. Yeah. And hang with them. Yeah. And then let that build over time. I think yep. that's a great piece of advice. Absolutely. Well, I'm so grateful we got to talk about this topic because I know it's been hanging out there and people have been curious about it. And it, it just seems to get more and more 
present and central all the time. So yeah. I know this will be in- incredibly helpful to everybody who's been wondering, should I do audio? And if I want to, how do I start? Absolutely. So, and if anyone has any questions, like, you know, they can shoot you an email, you can shoot it to me or whatever. Um it's so cool nowadays that we have connections to each other and we can be available to each other. So yeah, it's um it's a big topic. There's a lot to talk about. Definitely. And yes, please, anyone leave comments, reach out. I'm on Twitter. We're going to put links to all of Rachel's site and her contact information in the show notes. So you can check that out there and reach out to her as well. Thank all you right. so much for coming on. This has been great. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.